Hey, Pastor Marcus Rosa here from Westside Emanuel Baptist Church in Bogalusa, Louisiana. You know, in our current climate, we're seeing so much division and hatred, and there's a real inability to actually just have a conversation. And so here was the idea. Let's gather together uh, a diverse group of people from across our community, white, black, male, female, Democrat, Republican, and let's just have a great meal together and a time of discussion. It's hard for me to hate you when I'm having a meal together and we can just talk and, and sensibly come together and realize we have some differences, we have some real issues to discuss, but we do know as a community that there is more that unites us than that which divides us. And so if we can get past the hatred and all of the different uh, opinions of, uh, of just the ways that we can handle this situation and in, in, in all of the difficulty of our nation right now, but if we could sit down and have a meal together and just talk as friends and new friends and people that we may not leave as best friends, but at least we've talked and listened and had a chance to increase our worldview. Now the greatest worldview, uh, that the only worldview that we could have that I, I as a pastor believe is the true issue is a worldview that has Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ as the center of our world. We, we will never have peace and justice until we have the Prince of Peace in the center of our world. But tonight you'll see folks who from all these different parts of a world, their world, come together and through salad and a meal and dessert, in the end, I think this might be a satisfying conversation. And so join us tonight for Table for 12, an opportunity for us to see that we can be different and have different opinions, but in the end, we can disagree agreeably. So join us tonight for this tough conversation, but a conversation that needs to be had. We're gonna jump into this conversation now. And this time, as Pastor Rosa explained, um, we just want a, a yes or no. Um, I believe he said yes was green, no was red. So the first question is, is there anything wrong with saying all lives matter? Be honest, be honest, don't. What's what now? In a way that kind of can be a trick question, yeah, but. <laughs> okay, let's put it this way. So put them down, let's do it this way. Is it okay to say Black Lives Matter? Okay, so okay, so let's let's do this. We want to give everybody an opportunity to um, to engage in a discussion uh, around this topic and around this subject. And I want you to feel completely open to be able to share. I guess the only real things I think would be obvious that we want to steer away from is like any personal attacks, any you know profanity or you know <laughs> anything like that. Just just productive. But at the end of the day. We do want honesty because that's really the only way that we move forward is if we're being honest because then we have a place to begin discussion, you know, see if we can arrive at consensus or uh, some type of agreement. So um, going back to the, the Black Lives Matter question, give me a green, a yes, if this has always been your opinion or a red if it has not always been your So if you've always felt that Black Lives Matter, at least in, in, in at least in the in terms of being aware of the phrase and and the idea of it, have you always been like, yes, I get that, and I'm I'm with that, or was there a point when you were not? Perfect, great, okay. So can I ask? Um, so there were a couple people who said they were not always with that. So. Could I ask if, if any of you are willing to elaborate on that and share, like, perhaps what may have changed? Or, yeah. 
though at first, you know, you didn't really understand the meaning behind the Black Lives Matter movement. And so your first initial thought is that everyone should be equal. We should all be equal. No one should be up here and no one should be down here. And, you know, if all things are equal, then you would think that all lives matter and that would be what your initial thought is until, you know, you start getting a better understanding of, you know, different um, aspects of what's going on and, and um, you know, you start seeing things that are happening. You know, I think that a lot of us go through lives with little blinders on and we're involved right here in what's going on around us and we don't really take a look outside of, you know, what we see every day or all the time. And so I think that, that that's, that's, I think with some people it really does take a conscious effort to stop and see. I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, um, you know, I was raised in, in Mississippi by, by parents who had some really clear ideas about race. Um, and taught a real separation of races and uh, an inferiority of certain races. And, uh, and so there had been a time where I would have said, that's a racist comment, only that black, I would have taken it as being, oh, here's what it is, I would have taken it as being only black lives matter. And it's had, it's been through a lot of just thinking about this and talking to people that I've come to understand that it's, the statement is not only black lives matter. Can I give you an example that I think about? Um, I, I picture myself being in the ER after shooting a, a nail into my hand with my nail gun. Okay? And I'm there and I need treatment. I do need treatment, I do. And then um, they bring Phil Thigpen in and he's got a wound to his neck. And so they get him in front of me and I scream, wait a second, all patients matter. Do you understand that? Yeah. And when I, so I guess when I look at the, um, the achievement gap in testing them a teacher, the achievement gap between blacks and whites, when I look at the, the poverty, the, the poverty in the black community, when I look at the When I look at the chances of a black male being killed by a handgun as compared to me, the white male, when I see that, I see that I have to change my thinking because in a sense, all I have is just a wound in my hand. And I think that many in the black community, in many ways, they're our most vulnerable. Does that make sense to you? Um, you, can, you can call me out if I'm wrong, you understand that? But um, I just think that I think the 250 years of slavery, but even more than that, 100 years of systematic discrimination under Jim Crow has broken parts of the black community so badly that it's the responsibility of everyone to say, this is just a hand wound I have. What can we do about this? Okay. All right. Uh, does anybody have a response to that, or you said about um, the, when you say all lives matter? It depends on when you're saying it. If you're saying it in a rebuttal to me saying that Black Lives Matter, then it's saying it seems insensitive because I use the example of. If I'm fighting a house fire and that house is on fire, you come out and say my house matters. Where your house is not the one that's in danger right now. We deal with the situations as they come up as being a problem. Your house is not a problem right now, so I'm not gonna be putting water on your house. You're not being dealt with in this manner right now, so there's no reason to bring awareness to it. But as soon as your house gets on fire, as soon as it started happening to you, I promise you, coming with water, I'm coming with signs, and I'm going to be right there with you, and I'm going to say whatever you're saying. So when you come back to me and say, all lives matter, and it's not happening to you, then it, to me, you're not looking at me or paying attention or being aware or having any humanity for what's taking place at this time. So like he said, with the artery and the finger, 
you're taught when you go into a um, situation where there's casualties or people that are hurt, you go for the severities first. Yeah, her leg is hurt, but his arteries hurt. Who needs the help the most? Her life matters just as well, but I'm near death. So I gotta, it hurts me to pass her because I know her personally, but you about to die. So I, I, she's screaming and hollering, but I gotta come get you. And I've been in that situation just recently when we had an episode here. I knew several people there and they were calling my name personally, but I gotta get this dude on the, on the stretcher and he's gotta get in the car. This is just a shoulder. This guy's been shot somewhere else, you know? So when you say that, you have to sit back and think about how you're saying it and why you're saying it, because it, it does matter. Uh, the example that I like to use is, if I'm having a conversation about breast cancer, no one jumps in and say, but prostate cancer is just as important. Why aren't we talking about prostate cancer? Can we just talk about breast cancer right now? Of course, prostate cancer is just as important as breast cancer but right now this is the topic and yes we know that guys die from breast cancer too my uncle died from breast cancer but it's rare it's not as, as prevalent as women so if we're having a conversation about breast cancer it's not necessary to say well prostate cancer is just as important because we already know that we're not saying that it's not and like i used to say maybe they should have said black lives matter too and maybe that would have taken away the, the the distraction that it became. But then it was like, but if you're just talking about breast cancer, can we just talk about breast cancer? We know prostate cancer matters, but breast cancer is the same. You know? I'm in full agreement with what everyone said. Tiffany and I were talking before we got started that oftentimes what's missing in conversation is it's nuanced. You can have two people who will agree on something, but sometimes you end up arguing about something because as it comes up, there's a different definition of terms. And I think sometimes when we talk about Black Lives Matter, many people will be in agreement, but there's a confusion about the terms. Whereas one person says, yes, I agree with another one says, no, you don't. Well, do you mean Black Lives Matter as a statement of fact, or do you mean it in agreement with the particular organization, Black Lives Matter Global Network. And some will say, yes, I do believe that Black Lives Matter, but no, I do not agree with everything that's taking place in the global network of Black Lives Matter, which is more encompassing of even broader issues. So I think that we have to allow a little bit of nuance there that, that someone can say, they might be uncomfortable saying, Black Lives Matter because they see it as an association with the global network that they don't fully agree with, but they do agree with the statement that yes, my, my black friends, their lives matter. And I think it's important for us to be able um, to hear people and how they understand the terms of what they mean by the terms of being used. So, and I'll just, in forthrightness, I don't hold every view of the Black Lives Matter Global Network. So in that sense, I don't necessarily identify them, but I have no problem and no hesitation what's law of saying Black Lives truly matter. In that case, I would be somewhat being confused. Well, I believe at this time, it's highly disrespectful and offensive to say all lives matter and to say blue lives matter and whoever else like want to come up with because I believe it's a trick of the enemy to keep us distracted. Every time we try to tackle a serious issue, something else pops up to keep us distracted, focusing on, focusing on what's most important at that time. And at this time, we're trying to focus in and lock in on this particular group of people. But then all these other distractions come in that will trigger other people's interest to say, okay, well, you're right, all lives do matter. We've never said that in the history of mankind that nobody's life doesn't matter, but people have shown us that black lives don't matter to certain people. And so when we see that, of course we have to address it, but then when you come to all this other stuff, it's a distraction to keep us divided and to stop us from focusing on the issues at hand. Right now we have a serious problem going on in our country, in this world, and we're trying to address it. But when you start seeing all this other stuff, guess what, it's a distraction. And people start picking sides. Say, well, you know what, all lives matter, what well, blue lives matter. We understand that. We've never said y'all lives doesn't matter. But it seems like it's a problem when we try to focus on this one issue and all these trashes pop up 
how can we ever get somewhere when every time you look up somebody's throwing a monkey wrench in there, messing up the whole engine. And I and I believe that overall it is offensive to sit at this time. It's kind of the same token of, you know, you, you see this George Floyd, for example, this happening, and you see people start protesting. And I mean, I really feel like, you know, when this happened and everyone saw it, pretty much everyone was on the same page. Everybody, this is wrong, this shouldn't have happened. You know, I, I don't remember seeing anybody say, oh, well, you know, that, it, you know. And then it started with the protest and stuff, and then you start seeing the rioting and the looting and all of those things. And then that's when you start seeing, like you said, people start kind of backing off and it's like, well, that, I don't agree with that. And you start having this disruption and this back and forth. So it's like, it's almost set up that way to, to keep people from agreeing on something. It's like when everybody's combined and everybody's agreeing, and then you have something else happen that kind of starts separating people. And they're, they're suddenly not on the same page. If that makes sense. That a lot of those rioters are not protesters. Right. The protesters are here, and then there's rioters, and then there's looters. There are three different people, groups of people, and they've arrested a lot of people that are agent provocateurs who come in to disrupt right. and try to take the narrative, change the narrative to something else. But I did personally see a few people come through my timeline saying, well, I would like to see what happened when it was only one video out. I'd like to see what happened before that video. I'm like, but you saw eight men and nine minutes of this video. What more do you need to see? Every LEO I know was saying, no, that's not okay. <laughs> but yeah, there were a few people saying that it was, you know, I still need more information. But the thing is, is that the protesters, the rioters and looters are three different groups of people. And the people that are paid, that are agent provocateurs, they come in all the time, every time there's ever been a black, I said it in that group three years ago, when, when they were having a Black Lives Matter thing, I said, that's not the group doing that, that's the, I said it back then, I met Antifa in Oakland at an Occupy Wall Street. I seen them pick up the brick and throw it through Citibank. I watched them do it. And when the news showed it that night, they stood next to the bank and they interviewed a black person to make it look like black people did it. I watched them do it and they told me, as I was there as an observer into videotape, and they told me, you're gonna need to, we're gonna tell you right now, you have about 45 seconds before it's getting ready to start because it was 20,000 people and I was at the back I made up my way all the way to the back filming and they were saying you need to get up there get up there hurry up get away from us it's getting ready to start and before I can get away from them I had glass coming glass was going all over the place and I'm looking at them I'm watching them all get together they're throwing rocks at the police they're doing all this stuff and so then that was the first time I started noticing that was a uh, like about 12 years ago or so. That was the first time I started noticing what they were doing. And then at this particular protest, there's a lot of other groups, not just Antifa. It's not the only group doing those things, and we've had the arrest to prove that. But it's not the protest. The protest is a constitutional right. Looting and rioting is not. I can honestly say that I don't personally know a single law enforcement officer that was in agreement you know, everybody said what happened was wrong. It should have never happened. I don't care what video you needed to see before and after. But I will say, in a lot of instances, the media plays us against each other. You, they will show you clips of a small section of what happened. When they did not show you what happened before that, and they did not show you what happened after that, they showed you what they wanted to show you in order to feed their objective. And I agree with that 100%. Because when you wear a uniform like this, there's no way that you can believe at all that any life doesn't matter more than any other life. And there's no way. You have to be able and ready and willing at all times to put yourself in front of a bullet for anybody, no matter what color skin that person may have. And if you can't, then you don't need that uniform. You don't need that badge. I'm sorry, you don't. I too was raised in a family that was very descriptive of the race, the race issue. You know, you stick with your race and that's where you stay. We were, you know, I, I had 
plenty, plenty friends outside of my race growing up. And my parents never cared if I brought them home, spent the night, they never cared. I was never taught to love anybody less, you know. So I think that's one of the reasons I'm able to do my job to the level that I'm able to do my job. I can tell you that the officers that we have here in the city are amazing. I will tell you that the police chief for our city has made a point to get rid of officers who do not believe in the same things that we believe in. When I first got hired with the city, the one thing he told me before I ever went to the police academy was, I want you to understand something. You're out there. You treat people the way you would want your family treated in that situation. If that is your brother being arrested, how would you want him to be treated while he's being arrested? If that's your grandmother sitting there in that car after a car accident, how would you want her treated? That's how you have to treat everybody, as though they're your family. And that's been something that has stuck with me. And I mean, my career is just beginning. It's in the baby stages. But it's something I take with me on every single call, every single one. I treat everybody with the same respect that I'm given. I believe 100% that the media is there to divide us. They love to stir it up. They love to keep us at each other's throats because nothing bothers them more to see than to see us to all come together. Absolutely, 100% believe that with everything. Else. Okay. So, so let me ask this question. So, of everyone sitting here, regardless of how you initially answered the question, um, was most of this insight and in, in, in the thoughts that, that we're talking about right now surrounding Black Lives Matter, how much of that has really come to the forefront just in the last three weeks? And how much of it was kind of there before? Or was it, was it that incident that made you go, oh, I, I get it, I need to pay attention to this, or yeah. Personally, it's, it's always been something that uh, has been in the background and an understanding in the background. But, you know, my personal experience with black friends, you know, my experience with them, which is very limited from my just one vantage point, uh, I'm not experiencing the racism, it's an issue, maybe it's an issue somewhere else or somebody else. But what this has done is it has put it in my mind from the back burner to the front burner and is giving attention. And now I'm hearing from more black friends about personal experiences and say, no, this isn't just something that was happening. It's not just something that's necessarily in other places, but here are the very real issues that we have faced personally. So. It has been uh, a background knowledge, but yes, in the last month or so, it has come to the forefront of my attention. I think you also have back to back, you know, the, the man shot in Georgia, and I'm sorry, his name escapes me, I'm not having a guess. And then the George Floyd, and it was like, bam, bam, it happened, you know, and oh yeah, and Rihanna too. Like, you know, you had three situations where most everybody was on the same page, like this this should not have happened. And, and so I think that that, that kind of, it kind of stuns you and it makes you kind of have to stand up and pay attention. If that makes sense, I don't want you to know. What changed for me was um, for the first time in my life, I began to worry about my size and my appearance and how I look. And I've never worried about that. You know, people say, man, you're tall, you're big, you're huge. Okay, yeah, I've been that way since fourth grade, the biggest kid on, in fourth grade. So that's been me, and I've never had to think about it. And now, at 48 years old, I'm concerned about how I look, how I come off. When I Am I going to get out of my car, and when I raise up over my car? You know, am I too big? Am I intimidating? What am I putting off? Because I had a young kid that pulled me over like 12.30 one night and he talked kind of hard to me, you know? And I felt some type of way, you know? Everybody knows me, knows that I'm not that threat, you know? But I'm like, wow, this he's handling me and I've got a yes sir and, and be nice to him, hadn't done anything. 
And um, I was I was dating somebody that was of another color that was white at the time, and they were nonchalant and just on the phone and texting and not even paying attention to it. And I get back in the car and I'm feeling some type of way, and they're like, "What is wrong?" And I'm like, "I just got handled back there. All of this is going on." And that was the moment that I started thinking about how I look and how I, how I come across. You know, am I was I intimidating? Could he have been afraid or think that I'm gonna do something to him out there by himself at 12:30 at night? I get his side of it. You know, I completely get it. But that was my thought was there's always a first. There was a first in Baton Rouge and it just happened there. And I'm like, it's coming this way. I don't want to be the first that it happened to in Franklinton. So when I would share things in, on my post, I would always say to my friends on Facebook, think about what's happening because it could be me. You know who I am and it could be me because they don't care that I have a Bible on my back seat coming from Bible study and was hanging around 10, 11 o'clock at night and now I'm on the road and you pull me over and I look threatening to you. They don't care that I got this shirt in my closet at home, you know, because I don't, have, they don't care because whatever you feel, you feel. So I would always say, just think about it. You're, you're not paying attention to it, but it could be me. Because at that moment, I felt like it could have been. And now I'm in a position where for the first time in my life, I think about my size. And it's never been a factor to me. It's been a factor to everybody else. But now I think about it. And I agree with you 100% what you're saying. My first time thinking about my size was in around 2016 when Trayvon Martin was killed. Uh, I started to be conscious of how I look and how I carry myself when I'm dealing with officers who don't know me. And I got stopped. I brought my truck, the truck I'm in now, I think it was 2016, when the year was flooded here. And I was coming in about five that morning. I drove my truck to Dallas, Texas. I flew there and I drove the truck home. And the police officer pulled me over. I was speeding, so I told my I understand that you got the right ticket because I'm sleeping. And I'm trying to hurry up and get home so I don't make it home. He pulled me over. Initially, I put my hands out the window so he could see him. He asked me to step out the vehicle. I said, about the vehicle. He said, I need the license, the registration. I said, sir, the license is right here in this box. The registration right here in this box. I said, if you don't mind, can you walk over here so that you can see what I'm doing? By this 5.30 in the morning, I got five kids. I want them to see me by 6.15 when I make it home. And when I reached in that vehicle, he put his hand on his gun. I seen my life flash in front of me. Because my thing is, once I make you comfortable, I believe that police officers have an obligation to make the citizen comfortable as well. And he never done that for me, not once. He had his hand on that gun the whole time I was talking to him. And like you said, I get back in the car and I'm shaking. Like, so many things rush to my mind. And for years, we've always heard the jokes about Rodney King. It's been a punchline since 1995 about how they beat him and the things that went on with me on video. And I'm just telling you that I always, since that time, I always been concerned about, am I too big? Do I need to lose about 100 pounds and just don't look intimidating because I mean, what would make him feel like I'm trying to hurt him? I just want to get home as well. Write my ticket, let me go home. But I'm not trying to speak that. I will speak, give me the ticket, let me go home. But he never took his hand off that gun and that bothered me. Uh, and even to this day, I think about it. Most black families have to have a conversation with their children and tell their children how to interact with police. And um, my kids grew up in a law enforcement household. And one of my kids called me the other day having a nervous breakdown, almost just crying on the phone because they had hit a wall. All of the stuff, all I, I had to say, get off of, I don't, I don't want you to be on social media. I don't want you to look at the news. I want you to get away from it for a little while. And they were like, well, what if, what if they don't, they don't know when they pull me over that my parent is a law enforcement officer. All they see is a black person. That could have been me. And they were like, well, this is what happened to my friend. My friend did this and this is what happened. And, and he was in college and I, and I was like, but that didn't happen to you. And I had to remind them, you have a lot of law enforcement, from federal all the way down to security. So you know that 
I put it on my wall all the time. Bad cops do not represent law enforcement. And I put that on my wall all the time on a regular basis because it's given black people PTSD. When we see, when a, when a situation comes, I always say it's like a little over 90% black, of, um, 90% of cops are, 95% are, are, get up every morning, they put their lives on the line for us, they just wanna get home to their family alive. The other 5% we know from the FBI report that they join the force with an agenda. The FBI put out a report years ago that they have infiltrated police departments all across the country. So we know that they're there and a lot of us have met them. But I have to keep reminding people that when a bad cop does something, they put it on loop. It gets at least six moon cycles and it's all it goes viral on social media on all the different platforms. But when a cop is outside playing basketball with some kids, you, you might see it come through your timeline once. You know, so when all you see is when something bad happens, it literally gives black people PTSD. And when a cop gets behind a black person, even when you're a law-abiding citizen and you know you have not done anything wrong, a lot of black people get anxiety attack on this. They get panic attacks. But like he said, he put his hand out the window. That's a man of God, Me too. I mean, that's what they feel because they don't know if they're running into that 95% good cops or if they're running into that 5% bad cop because it just takes one to, to take your life. And you don't know if it's, you know that the majority of them are good, but you know that those other ones are out there that join the force in an agenda. And those are the ones that you see on loop all the time. Absolutely, 100%. And I'm gonna tell you that it makes it 10 times harder for the good ones. Because I can't tell you how many times just here in our city, myself and my partner, got out on Columbia Street on foot patrol because we had heard several statements. If you want to get out of the community, if you want to make the people in the community feel safe, get out with us. Get out with us. So we did. Before, I'm going to say 10, 20 minutes passed, pulled up Facebook. First thing we saw was cops out here harassing people on Columbia Street. And I can't tell you how that made us feel because we were trying to do good. <laughs> right and I have myself and anybody you know that has come into contact with me knows that I keep a basket in my car and I keep toys and candy and anything like that and I hand it out you know and I, I usually during the summer I keep a little ice chest with water in it and if I see somebody out there and it's you know they're soaking wet with sweat I'm going to hand them a cold bottle of water pulled up to this lady she was in her little flower garden and an elderly black lady and she looked me in the face and she said I don't need nothing from no white pig and it literally made me ill. and it, it I mean it gets to that point where you feel like the more you try to do good and say hey we want to be here we want to do right we want to do the good things we want to show our community our number one priority is to keep you safe not to have you afraid of it seems like we're met with just that much resistance. You know what I mean? Like it, they they will put you, and I'm gonna say they as in me, they will put officers in such a bad light that even the good ones are smothered out. And then we can't find our way out, can't find our way to show our community that we are here, we have your back, and we, we want you to know that above all things. I can tell you that in my short time as an officer, there have been two, two deaths in this community that have affected me in the way I, I teach my kids and in the way I police, and both of those were black people. One of them I held his hand as he took his last word, and I will never forget it. And I have come into contact with kids since then, and I said, you know, and they'll, you know, they say all these derogatory remarks toward me because I'm a white officer. And I've looked them in the face and, I, and I've said, you know, I've, I've sat there and held the hand of a black man while he took his last breath when his friends left him there to die by himself. Don't put that on me. Don't put me in the same group as the bad ones because I'm not. 
what put them. Then we had this gentleman that was recently murdered here in our community. That was my first case as a detective. And I reached out to his mom, because that was Mother's Day. That was Mother's Day. And I went home to my kids, and I sat there, and I looked at my kids, and the only thing I could think about was that mom. That mom, it didn't matter what color her skin was. It didn't matter what her son did for a living. It didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was somebody took that man's life. Somebody took his life. He wasn't going home to his children. He wasn't going home to give his mom a hug for Mother's Day. She was never going to see that kid again. And I sat there at Mother's Day with my own children, my three little girls, who I teach wrong from right and who I teach not to hate another race. You love everybody because Jesus loves us all. And I looked them in the face. And it made me sick because I knew this woman was over here born in her son. We're not all bad officers. We're not. We're not all. We're not all the same ones that you see in the media because that's what they want you to see. I have actually deactivated my Facebook account. And I have lost so many of my friends. Close, <clears throat> close friends that came home with me from school. Because they are black and I'm an officer. They no longer want anything to do with me. And I can't tell you how that makes me feel as a person or as a police officer. It is very painful. Columbia Street or any of the other streets over there because they expect you to come over there to harass them. And they're not used to seeing community policing. So if you're going to, if you guys, you know, every now and then you want to do community policing, maybe find somebody that you know over there and like hang out with them for a little while so they can see you guys engaging and then just walk around and speak to people. And the more they see you over there and not doing anything, anybody just getting out, getting to know people, the more they'll trust that you're just there to, to community police. You're not there to harass them. But it's going to be a process. It's not going to be a long right thing. And I'm really sorry that you have to experience that as a good cop based on what the bad cop is. It's not to walk with you and know anytime you want to do that, you know, like the days that I work, to have my uniform on and go out together. Because I want to get out there myself, you know, just because of the position that I'm in now. I'm, I'm proud of it that I made this chief because not a lot of us have. So I, I want to go out and I want the kids, black and white, to see me in that position. And I, I ride around and I play on the PA like a little kid, man. And you see, I see the children. I'm like, whoa, what's up now? You know, and I, you know, and I, I ride through the areas that the fire trucks usually don't ride through, just to be out and about and let them see the fire truck. Cause I'm a, I'm a server. I'm even outside the fire department, that's what I am. I'm a people person. So when the little kids are out, I make sure I cut the lights on and I say something to them on the PA. You know, and I go through the projects, and I go through Sunset Acres, through the horseshoe, places that we usually don't in the vehicles, you know, to let them see it and to see me driving in it because I know a lot of them, black and white, so they can be like, oh, snap, I like that. I, that's Mr. Agent. I want to do that. You know, so I would gladly, you know, park somewhere and we get out and walk and do it together. You know, I don't have a problem with that. The person that he was talking about, where the man kept his hand on the yeah. gun the whole time, intimidating him. That was unnecessary intimidation. And that's that's what, because he hadn't given him a reason to feel that. But that's what they're expecting, is that person. So that's going to be amazing if you guys do that together. You know, we, we don't go into this job expecting there not to be some form of danger. And it's not always going to be something that involves a firearm or a taser or anything like that. Sometimes you have to go hand in hand. And, you know, there was a, there was a time where I... I did a traffic stop on somebody. He had been sitting at a stop sign for a little while. And, you know, as soon as I walked up to the car, I could tell something wasn't just right. And he was he was a big, big guy, you know, very intimidating in size for me being a petite female, you know, officer. Um, he was a black gentleman. And I just kind of talked to him, and I could tell he was a little sluggish and something wasn't quite right. You know, so I ran him through our system, found out he had an attachment, went through the necessary steps. And I said, okay, well, normally in this case, I would say, little buddy, you have an attachment. You just need to make sure you get that fixed. And if he seemed okay, let him go on his way. But because he seemed off, I was going to go ahead and take him in on the attachment. And he
try to figure out what was going on. As I went and put him into cuffs, he elbowed me in the face. I fall backwards, I'm kind of stunned, you know, seeing spots, you know, he caught me right in the chin. And he took off running. Chased this man for, I'm gonna probably say about three blocks. Found him two days later, I arrested him, he's in jail. I'm gonna say probably about two months ago, the DA calls me and she says, you know, he's he's in the ref, he's in the reform program and he's doing real good in the reentry program. And, you know, we were wondering how you felt about lowering the charges. And I said, absolutely, absolutely. But my biggest thing for agreeing with lowering his charges had nothing to do with anything other than the fact that after I arrested him and he got out, he came back to that jail two days after he got out of jail and apologized to me. And I think that meant more to me than anything. To me, that made him more of a man, you know what I'm saying? And I could see him on the street right now and tell you that I'll, I'll shake his hand and say, hey man, I, I'm glad to hear you doing good. You know? I don't mind dropping charges or doing whatever it needs. You need to get your life right. You were not in a good place that morning. That was five o'clock in the morning. You were not in a good place. And who knows, maybe what happened opened his eyes. Maybe that's one reason he's getting his stuff together. You just were, you did your job as a police officer right. and you got him two days later. You didn't shoot him. Exactly. It was yeah. not my place so, to know <laughs> what he was doing there at five o'clock. You know, it was only my my place to, to do what I needed to do to make sure he was safe in my community. We just heard from, uh, just prior uh, to this Casey there, we heard from from three black people that, that gave personal examples of interactions with police that were negative, right? <clears throat> and then we've heard you talk about the police 99% being, you know, positive. So I guess the question I want to ask is, how can both of those things exist simultaneously or at least how do we view that? Because, and speaking as a black man myself, I know what they're saying is true. And I've had my own situations that I've encountered. And I fully know, I know what you're saying. The, the majority, <laughs> absolutely. But there's something, there's something out there that it's happening, right? And so, <clears throat> So I'm going to ask this twofold. One is, um, to what degree do we, um, do you all understand the frustration and the anger and the sadness and this moment that we're in for the black community and how they view? Because clearly it's happening. You know what I mean? Like, it, and I think for a long time. There's this perception, I think one of the reasons, that, again, that you uh, get the reaction that you have where, where people aren't as receptive in the neighborhoods is because they have had those real examples, either personally or it's been passed down that what well, happened to dad or it happened to granddad or whatever. Yeah. You've seen it happen, right. So, um, and I may be asking the impossible right now for an, for an answer to all of that, but I'm just, I'm just curious what the, what the thought process, process is when we hear both of those things coexisting, and, and then going into how do we, how do we rectify, how do we solve that? And, and I will say that I'm encouraged, and it just made me smile just to see the interaction between the two of you coming up with a, well, at least we can do this, we can partner on this, and we can make this happen. And I think that that's what this really is all about anyway. It's about us coming together and having conversations and finding solutions. Because I think we can if we educate one another. So I would love for you to educate me <laughs> as to um, you know, how, how you view that, uh, both of those things existing and, and how, how do we get around that? Because somehow or another, that minority of bad cops is having a plurality of effect on a black community. So I'm curious to know, just anybody who wants to share. Sure. I think that one of the issues that the community has is when there is a blatant 
incident like that, if there's no accountability, that's when there's a lot of frustration and distrust in a community. So when you see somebody choke out somebody on live TV or shoot them when they're running, uh, running away from you and things like that, then the even when the chief try to terminate a person and then the union come in and get them back their job, um, the chief has already acknowledged what they did was wrong, but then the union get them their job back, then that makes the community feel like our lives don't matter. So we just saw you kill a person on TV. The chief agreed that it was wrong, it was not policy. They decided you were terminated and then the union got them their job back. So if there's accountability, I think, like when I see a situation like that, I don't go out and protest, but what I do is contact the Department of Justice and I send a fax or an email and with a link to the situation saying, can you please investigate this? And um, that's, which is an action that you can take. Um, and um, also what I encourage people to do instead of saying the police did this to me, I would say Officer Smith did this to me because that would take it away from all police are doing this to this individual police did that. But when, this, when the department supports that behavior and there's no accountability for that behavior, then they feel like the police are all uh, taking it up for each other and covering up their crime. So if it's a crime, whether it's by a police or a civilian, it should be accountability. And if you say, Officer Smith did this to me instead of the police did this to me, then that makes it an individual thing. Just like I don't like people to say, well, black people did this. I'm like, ah, oh, my name is not baby. I didn't do that to you. I'm over here minding my own business. I don't go around doing this. I don't go around doing that. He did that, not me. We are not monolithic. Well, the police are not monolithic either. <coughs> so the system the, the systemic issues within the police department need to be addressed, which a lot of them are doing now. Camden, New Jersey, actually, uh, they actually did the whole police department all over to change, to address those issues. And so there are police departments across the country that are addressing them. And I saw a police department, a police uh, officer in San Jose, California, addressing the rookies and telling them, he showed them the video of Floyd and said, if anybody in here thinks that this is okay, you need to walk out of this training right now. You know, and uh, another issue is a friend of mine that saw him, went through the training, post-training, when they did the gun class, you know how they have to shoot, determine whether they're gonna shoot if it's a good person or a bad person. A bad person will pop up, they gotta shoot. A good person will pop up, they gotta refrain. Well, he said, what he discovered about himself because when he got out of training he realized that he was intimidated by black people and he had not been his entire life and he said in the training every time what he discovered was every time the bad person popped up it was a black person and every time the good person popped up it was a white person and he did not realize that that had did something to him mentally that when he got on the street he saw black people as the bad people and the white people as the good people and he had to go back and address that he did that he went to therapy to find figure that out because he had to figure out why was he getting these feelings when he would pull over black person and he traced it back to when he was in training and the, and that happened and he brought it to their attention and they actually changed it they did address it and even you know we train every year you know we have to go out and do firearms training every year we don't even put <laughs> replicas of people like it's just a green human shaped blob basically you know and I, that was a lot of the reason that you know everybody switched to that you know because there was i think there was a lot of issues with that yeah I was just and i honestly feel like you know like adrian and i were saying you know it's going to take us getting out in the community more you know we're going to have to do more than just active patrol are going to have to do more than just respond to the calls and it's going to take time because you know like martin luther king said darkness doesn't drive out darkness only light can hate can't drive out hate only love can and that's the only way you're going to do it you're going to have to change the mind frame and you can't do that by patrolling 
you can't do that by just sitting in your car driving all night. You're gonna have to get out. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to do the community policing in order to change the community's mindset. <clears throat> That's the only way you're gonna be able to do it. There's, it's gonna take a lot more of what Adrian and I were discussing earlier. It's gonna take a lot of it. The community has to be able to trust the people to have, you know, the, the people that have the badges to protect them and not just look at them as criminals. So, so let's, let's say this then, then let's shift it since that's kind of where the conversation has gone to, again, going back to the idea of solutions of what can we do for this particular specific community? What are the types of things that we can do, one, to help you in that? Are there, are there any ideas of things that we can initiate to create that environment or those opportunities to bring the community the community and the police to you? You know how you guys do that annual thing where you guys go to everybody, the city council and the police and everyone go to the different, uh, every district has a kind of a barbecue thing. Like you, we did, uh, I think ours was on Avenue B, and then there was one over, uh, I think, uh, yeah. Gates did hers at Youth Bill. Yeah, that night. It's like, it would be nice if maybe like the police played baseball against the kids in that area or something, or something to interact and stuff. Because we got to start with the kids really to change the mindset of, of that, of, uh, of trusting and all of that stuff. And the parents will love the fact that their kids are engaged, so their mindset will be changed on that. But uh, that's that's something also I think. Going back with to something the officer said, and I know that all police officers are not bad. Most officers are great human beings, are great individuals, uh, <sighs> and they want to do a great job. And we're trying to break the mindset that most officers are bad, while also working evenly to break the mindset that all black people are bad. Because when we are pulled over, I, I want you to understand most black people are great individuals and great human beings too. And if we can all listen and learn from each other, we can understand that for the most part, we got great people on this earth. God made some awesome creations. The problem is we don't spend enough time around each other because the enemy have made sure that we don't go to school together, we don't live in a neighborhood together, and we don't go to church together. Right. And because of those three factors, it's hard to really know a person who you don't have no relationship, you have relationship with, or have no uh, fellowship with outside of Walmart or the dollar store or getting pulled over. And I met Mr. Mark for the first time today. I met Miss Tiffany for the first time today. So you know, the next time I see them, I can say, hey, Mr. Mark, how you doing? Hey, Miss Tiffany, how you doing? It takes somebody who care enough to really put some steps in place to improve the racial relationships. Now, I'm going to say this thing I'm going to do for today. My, one of my favorite movies is a movie called Lean On Me, Joe Clark. And Clark was given a school, based on a true story, he was given a school that was beyond a failing school. Clark came in and took some drastic steps to improve the quality of education at the school system. And a lot of people disagree with him. They disagree with his methods. But he made it a point to do things the way he felt they need to be done. Somebody got to have enough courage in this city to step up to the plate and take some drastic steps and make sure that we have a diverse city in the police department, in the sheriff department, at the hospital, wherever you go, we need more diversity so that when i see mr martin i know him because i've had a, some dinners with him but guess what even the officers that was out there were four white officers one black man imagine there have been a black cop there like the owner of stoke said if i would have been working i know mr george he knew the owner knew the guy he said i would have never called the police why because he knew him. he understood george and had some issues in his life but george is not that bad individual today and I believe we have to make sure that all of us are doing what we can to get to know one another and stop shying away from the issues. Stop shying away from the truth. Stop acting like it's gonna be okay. Some people just want us to die out, die over and die off so we can move on to regular life. We'll never go back to regular life because so many people are hurt. 
Too many people are frustrated. So many people, officers, black people, white people, so many people are offended. And until we can sit down and try to come to some, some common ground and find a place to meet and say, okay, let's start here. But we need diversity in every area of the criminal justice system. We need diversity, you know, in every aspect of life because how we going to get to know each other. I live in my bubble. He lived in his bubble. And had not been this day, I probably would have never met this gym. Now, she's been in books her whole life. I've been in my whole life. I don't know if I've ever seen her in person. It's going to take somebody to take some drastic steps and say, hey, you know what? We ain't number 13, 12,000 people here. We shouldn't have no racial issues with a city that's 50 50 black and white. But somebody don't want to change. And we need to find out who that person is and make sure we get them removed from whatever position they're in because it's a trick of the enemy to keep us divided. Because we come together, we have the best seat in the world. We've talked about it. You know, there's been a group of us who've been working on it, you know, a couple of years now. Bruce is, has been, the, you know, one of the people that has kind of pushed for this. And I know with the groups that I've been involved in, with, we, you know, we've tried to have events and we've tried to have things and, you know, we want to try to bring people together. People don't show up. You know, I can tell you right now, um, one thing that we do, if if the coronavirus stuff it allows us to start having events now, Parks and Rex um, Commission, we put on the Christmas on Austin Street. And last year we sent a letter to every church, every church in the city and asked them to participate. And it's basically a, a free event we put on for the kids. And uh, I, I know so, several of y'all were there. I didn't make it last year because my husband had surgery. But um, we asked, we, we sent a letter out to every church, asking every church to participate. And I think we had four that came out and participated. And then we had others that came out and was like, oh, we really want to appreciate, you know, participate next year. We're, I think it's going to take things like that where we all come together, you know. And you talk about everybody being in their own little bubble. Well, the church is kind of one of those things where everybody, you know, congregates together and then, you know, they don't interact and everything. So if we can have those type of events where we encourage everyone to come together and you know you go to your church and you go to your church and you go to your church and you, you go to your church and you say okay well we need to get involved and we need to do this that'll help to bring people together and help people you know meet some people and get to know one another and um, I just feel like that that's one way that we can do it you know that, that we can come together and, and get to know one another address it in a twofold way. One is personal and one societal. And in a personal sense, myself being a pastor belonging to the Christian community, and uh, Pastor Ori, Pastor Rosa off camera, uh, we have a responsibility in our pulpit. So we, we declare the gospel and looking at the truths of scripture that God has created male and female in his own image. He's created us in his own image and that is true of all people. And that we look throughout the Bible, even at the end of the Bible, we find that uh, on that day, gathered around the throne, will be people of every tribe, tongue, nation, and group. And ultimately, we look to the cross and the empty tomb, seeing that Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the dead, so that whosoever believes in Him, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So uh, that's irrespective of race. And in fact, uh, we find in the Great Commission, Jesus had talked about making disciples of not just all nations as in geopolitical nations but all ethnicities all ethnos so from pulpits we declare this that we ought to be welcoming people of all races and we ought to love all people loving the lord our god with all our heart soul mind strength and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves so as we're promoting this in our pulpits and in our churches and infiltrating into our homes then we have a personal opportunity to seek to break down these barriers by by truly loving our neighbors as we love ourselves and irrespective of whatever race they be. On a societal level, I think it's very reasonable to say that there's some sort of reform that is needed, some sort of reform in law enforcement. And I'm not even going to pretend that I know what that solution is. I don't know. I'm grateful that I'm not a lawmaker. Uh, but I don't know what it is. There shouldn't be change just for the sake of change, but there needs to be some good common sense, whatever common sense is. There needs to be some good common sense reform to make an impact on a societal scale. So I, I would think that societal 
we need that uh, in formalized legal steps. But on the personal scale, those are things that we can affect. And if we are personally growing in fellowship with our Creator and in fellowship with our fellow man, that is going to positively impact both of us in ways we've never experienced. I, I appreciate that. I agree with you. You know, obviously, I agree with everything you said. Um, however, we all know that for the most part, especially in this community, Sunday, you know, as I say, is the most segregated time, you know, Sunday morning, because we go into our bubbles and, and we preach love and all that stuff, and then we come out and we don't come together. So, how can we push the envelope of making that happen? Do you. For instance, do you feel that it's incumbent upon uh, pastors like yourself to reach out to the other pastors and encourage them to take part in some type of of gathering and fellowship of of their various congregations and coming together? That would be a good idea to um, to have churches to intermingle. Like today, we're going to have service at Brother Ob's church, or today we're going to have church at Brother Marcus's church, or First church, you know, I, that would be something that's never been done before. What you're getting to see, <clears throat> you're getting to see two different cultures and how they worship as well, because that makes a difference as well. You know, because you're going to go into a church where you're used to clapping and stomping, and then you're going to go and you're going to find out that they don't clap and stomp, but they still have a good word. And they're preaching the love and, and the Christianity that we're hearing as well but it's just being done differently. So that would be something, you know, for the different churches to go inside of each other or either meet at a neutral place or whatever it may be, if need be. You know, meet in one of the auditoriums, this church and that church this Sunday. And um, you get to see people for who they are because that's gonna bring you together. You know, whether you want to believe it or not, to see somebody worshiping God. If, if you've got that in you, then you're gonna relate. If you just in there, then yeah, it's not gonna happen. But if you if you're if that's what you're seeking and that's what you're in there for, you'll see the difference. And I think that that will be a good idea. I have a community revival. I haven't revealed the shit. I've been praying on about two weeks now. And, you know, y'all kind of forcing my hand a little bit, but uh, I have ten preachers in mind. I want to take the beatitudes. Each preacher take one of them. Or five black, five white, and. Uh, around some parking lot here in town and invite as many people as we can to come out. But we're also gonna take our time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to fellowship, walk around and get to know somebody. You know, I'm gonna speak to somebody you didn't come here with. Um, because we gotta take some real steps into trying to improve these relationships. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And I think that would be a good opportunity for, you know, the, the police force to come out as well, yeah. you know, for us to intermingle and get to know the people of our community. Because you're going to follow your pastor. Exactly. And, you know, I, like I said, I grew up where we were separate. I had never stepped foot in a black church before. I'm not even going to lie. And one time, Pastor Ulrey had a back the blue type service, and he invited my shift. And I remember some of the officers got a call, and me and my partner looked at each other. He said, they got to back them up. I said, no, I'm having fun. And we stayed right there. <laughs> We didn't even leave, and I was not even sorry. <laughs> so. was on the fourth Sunday of every month, we fellowship with another church. And although we were a church of God in Christ, we would have Assembly of God was a Latina church that would come. We had a white Baptist church. We had different, different, not only just different churches, but different denominations. So every, every uh, fourth Sunday, we knew that we would be fellowshipping with a different church. And my dad's assistant pastor was white at the, at the California church too, so. so Pastor Rick, I'll read you got that. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> say one thing about what I was going to say about the police. In terms of the black community supporting the police, I think that when we have to promote more of when a situation happened in town, we have to go out into our own community and promote them to give what information they have to the police so that the police can solve the crime. Because we can't say we want justice and then we don't participate in them getting us justice. You know, we have to be able to go and say 
what I did was I just put up some things and I called some people and went over to the community and talked to some people and I said, if you're scared to talk to them, you tell me and I will talk to them. And then I also gave them Mitch Castleberry's number because I called him and he and I talked. I'm like, you can call him directly. Well, you don't have to give your name or you can do the anonymous tip line or you can call him directly because he'll know what questions to ask you if there's any extra information. But there are some people who are afraid. There are some people who might have an attachment that might have been there that had information or something. So we talked about that. Maybe getting an extra date. Maybe getting their date there for their attachment, getting a new court date for it so that they can come forward and give their information. So we were talking about what kind of solutions we can get the community to be able to give the information that they may have to work with the police as well. So we have to work on that too. So as individuals, we have to reach out to other people in our community and work on that. And I feel like it's so possible the community comes with our department, you know, and a lot of that is being let down. We don't want to let them down. I know Miss Renee calls us every couple days about her son's murder case. She calls every couple days and we give her a status update. We don't want to let her down. And I feel like once the community sees that we are trying, we we want to work these cases. We want to, to, to find justice for everybody that deserves it, you know. I think once the community sees that a little more, maybe they'll, you know, they'll be a little more hopeful where their where their police department is concerned, you know. They won't feel like we're just not even trying or we're just going to let it go or we're not even going to bother. I could certainly go on and on and on with this discussion and, and want to, <laughs> um, but I know we all have to, we have our lives and we have to uh, move on. Uh, but I do just want to wrap this up and just see, just one last thing, if, if there's anybody who didn't get a chance to speak that would like to say something, um, we can do that quickly and then... Um, I just go back to this time, everything, especially as far as the racial issue, is really about accountability as far as the police department and all that. I love law enforcement. I was born into law enforcement. I was raised by Mr. Mr. Kenny. You know, I know all the old school. I agree with 100%. Um, for instance, my family was one of the ones that went viral for the basketball thing. Kendall Bullen, he, he showed up at my house, a house full of, of black and white kids. We're a biracial family. You know, he sat there, him and his crew, doing shooting basketball hoops with my kids. They were being too loud. He didn't do anything because he was a bunch of kids, not, not in any trouble, just having fun, staying off the streets. My nephews, not so lucky, they were shooting basketball in the projects. Not where they live or anything, but they went just to shoot basketball to entertain themselves. One black kid, two biracial kids, one white kid. The black kid and the two biracial kids were absolutely interrogated, were brought from where they were to supposedly where whatever was broken into, just racially profiled. Not all cops, I'm just saying. You know, but with the Black Lives Matter, I have to be more conscious now just being in a, in a biracial family. You know, I always have, black lives have always mattered, but as a white woman, I will never know what black people went through. I will never know that. So now, just recently with everything, you know, going on, I'm more conscious of the things I'm saying. I'm more conscious of Adrian's feelings, of Brother Mike's feelings, your feelings, you know, just because of the situation. I want to learn more. I don't know what my ancestors did. Then like Ty said, don't classify me with what every black person did. I don't want to be classified with what every white person did either, you know, because, you know, you get that from some people, but it takes change from home as well, not just law enforcement. People are taught hate. You, you're not born with hate. People are taught hate. Children are taught hate. Yes. So, most of you know me know I have um, a love for, for music and theater and all of that. And on that note, there is uh, a song that's called uh, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught. And leave us from South Pacific. But the whole thing, the whole song is explaining that you aren't born that way, that you have to be taught to be suspicious. You have to be taught to hate. You have to be taught to look at somebody a certain way. You've got to be carefully taught. and 
Uh, I encourage you to look that up. <laughs> it's actually a really good song, good show. Um, but anyway, thank you all again so much uh, for participating, for your honesty, um, for your suggestions, and uh, I look forward to more of these. I want to thank Pastor Rosa for hosting and for Brown Soul Kitchen for the food. And, um, and again, thank all of you. We hope, not we hope, we're going to continue this movement forward. And one of the things I would like to ask everybody present and those who will be watching this is to do your part. Like you, Pastor Thickpen talked about what you can do as an individual and then what, you, what we can do societally. So each of us can be responsible for, Bruce can be responsible for Bruce. And so as we, as we go about our lives, let's, let's not allow this, as Pastor Ori said, to become, let's go back to business as usual. Okay, let's not allow that to happen. So we all know that we have interactions, whether it's online or in person with people who, who have different thoughts than the ones that are, have been expressed this evening about bringing people together. And we need to put those people in check, you know? And I, and I mean that with love, right? I mean that with love and through education and communication and perhaps invite them to these types of discussions or just one-on-one -on -one try to invite people to those types of uh, conversations. I've begun to do that. One of the things that I do that may be helpful for some of you, because it is uncomfortable. Sometimes I'll have friends that will post things. I go, oh man. And so what I've tried to do, 99% of the time I've been successful, <laughs> is to message them privately so that it doesn't become an, a public, I'm calling you out and all of that because immediately walls are gonna go up and it's gonna be difficult. So I usually contact them privately, you know, Messenger, and say, hey, you know I love you, <laughs> but either one, and this is, this is what happens a lot, is people will post something that's actually false. Like I've seen, I've seen a big trend on that now where people are posting and reposting and sharing things because they're already inclined to believe that. It makes, it falls into that that wheelhouse of what they what they already think. So they're like, that makes sense. And so they repost it. And it's actually from satire or it's from, you know, some satirical site or something else. And so I'll usually go privately and go, hey, by the way, that's not true what you posted. And I usually send them the proof. One of the places you can go is Snopes.com. Um, that's the one that's one of the ones that I find is really reliable because they'll not only tell you what's wrong, but they'll give you the historical evidence of it. Say, this is where that began, and this is how, and, and all of that. So, um, and then if it's satirical, they'll tell you, yeah, you know, that's what it is. But you can you can put different things out there and ask, is this true? And they'll either tell you yes, no, or it's partially true. Here's the real deal, you know. And at the end of the day, we have to realize that it takes work. We didn't get here overnight where we are right now, and we have to realize it's going to take some work. Now. I'm impatient and I want us to get there sooner than later. I'd like to see some, and I've already begun to see some of it. Um, but I encourage all of you to be the change that we want to see, right? I know it may sound cliche, but that's really what it is. Let's be the change that we want to see in the world, you know, and let's instigate that. So, again, thank you all so much and have a great evening. <laughs>